Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Jeffrey with the Christian Overwatch. Today we're going to be talking about this article, Eight Examples of Evolution in Action, and how that's not technically true. But first we need to define what exactly is evolution. So we're going to watch a clip here by Kent Hovind, uh, excellent creationist. Um, has done a lot of debates with evolutionists. Um, and has a, several series of videos out defining and talking about creation versus evolution. So we're just going to look at a cl clip here, and he's going to define the six different types of evolution. Let's define some other terms now. now the word evolution has at least six different meanings. And you've, we've, I've done 58 debates now, and if you're going to get into a debate on evolution with anybody, you better first define what you're talking about. Because this is a very slippery term, okay? First, we have cosmic evolution. That would be the Big Bang. There is no evidence whatsoever for that. We'll get into that in just a moment. Then we'd have to have chemical evolution. See, the Big Bang supposedly made hydrogen. Well, how did we get 92 elements plus the synthetic ones? I mean, how did the chemicals evolve? They don't talk about that much, but that would have to happen. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. You know, the stars would have to evolve. There's an awful lot of stars out there, folks, but nobody's ever seen one form. There's enough stars out there that everybody on Earth can personally own two trillion of them. We've never seen one star forming. We see them blow up from time to time. It's called a nova or a supernova. We've never seen one form. One professor told me one time, he said, well, we calculated in the laboratory that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough energy to make a brand new star. I said, well, that's brilliant. You've got to lose 20 to gain one. You ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> first place. That's all theoretical. We've never seen it happen, okay? And I think it is scientifically impossible. See, then we'd have to have organic evolution. That would be the origin of life. How did life get started from non-living material? Now, according to the evolution theory, that would have to happen somewhere along the line, long ago and far away. Life had to come from non-living material. And yet, we've never seen that happen. There is no evidence that it can happen. We'll talk about that in a minute. Fifthly, we would have macroevolution. That is where an animal changes into a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. But the evolutionist believes a dog came from a rock. If you go back far enough in time, 4.6 billion years. Finally, we have microevolution. I don't like this word, okay, because it gets people confused. I think we ought to just call it a variation. But microevolution happens, folks. That is a fact of science. Animals produce a variety of offspring, but it's always the same kind. The first five definitions of evolution are stupid. It doesn't happen. It's certainly not part of science. It's something you have to believe in. They teach the kids it all started with a big bang. Twenty. All right. So we're going to stop right there, and I'm actually going to back it up to right here. Um, so we can refer back to that in a minute. But... We're going to look over here at these things, these eight examples, and what you're going to see is eight examples of this microevolution, or more accurately, a variation of within kinds, because they're not really evolving, they're not becoming really more advanced, they're just becoming a different subset of the same kind. Your Chihuahua versus a Great Dane, it's still a dog. That one has longer legs, one has a bigger bark, it's still a dog. So what we're going to see is eight examples of this, but that does not prove this. Just because a dog can produce a dog does not prove that a dog came from a rock several billion years ago. So let's take a look at what they claim is examples of evolution in action, which it's not. So first up, is the peppered moth, one of their favorites of the evolutionists, the peppered moth. This was an experiment, well, observation, supposedly done, where there was a large population of white moths. And you can go down and read all of this yourself, I'll put a link in the description, but basically, large population of white moths, um, factories, um, this are there's a lot of smoke that's being put out, the trees turn black, the moths turn black, so they blend into the trees. The factories stop producing as much soot, the trees become white again, so do the moths, so they blend back in. The problem is, both this one and this one are both a moth. 
and it went back to the way it was. So it didn't actually change into anything but a moth. So all that proves is that a moth, even after it changes, is going to be a moth. This does not prove that anything that a moth can be anything but a moth. You can believe that, you can hypothesize that a moth could be anything but a moth, but this is not proof that a moth can be anything but a moth. Next, live birth in three-toed skinks. Now what this is talking about is that they can either lay eggs or give birth. And it's talking about that, there's, that, some, that they're kind of in between this supposed quote-unquote transition between live birth and between laying eggs and live birth. The problem is that while there is this quote-unquote transition, the three-toed skink is still giving birth, whether through an egg or live birth, to a three-toed skink. It's not producing a chicken. It's producing a skink. So you can hypothesize that this animal is in the verge of transition into some higher, more evolved species, but this doesn't prove it. All this proves is that a skink is now giving live birth instead of laying eggs, and it's still producing a skink. That's all we know because that's all we can observe. Scientists think science is something you can test, observe, it's repeatable. This is something we can test, observe, it's repeatable. We know it happens. That's science. If you would like to believe that this skink is going to produce something other than a skink, uh, that, that's fine, but that's not science. That's your belief. Okay, let's move down. Arms race between crabs and mussels. This is talking about an invasive species of crabs. I'm not going to read through it all, but if you'd like to, I'll put, like I said, the link's going to be in the description. Talking about these invasive species of crabs that come in and, as, and they are just destroying the population of mussels, and the mussels in response just start producing thicker shells. Well, the problem here is, if you haven't figured out the trend yet, the mussel, even though it has a thicker shell, is still a mussel. It is refusing to be anything but a mussel. It did not develop like a neurotoxin to fight against the crab. It did not develop machine guns. It developed a shell, which it already had. The information to make a shell was already in its genetic code. All it did was make it slightly thicker. That's not evolution. There's no new information. That does not prove that a, sh that a muscle can develop wings. That would be new information. That'd be amazing. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a muscle who already has a shell develop a thicker shell. And it's still a muscle. It's not evolution. This is talking about a genetic bottleneck in lizards. Um, Kind of like uh, what you see in the island uh, evolution, uh, kind of like what you see on in the Galapagos Islands, um, where Darwin saw his finches. Um, what often happens when a population is um, separated from the rest of the population, such as on an island, you see a bunch of weird things happen because you have a very limited gene pool. So, such in the case with Darwin's finches, you have the different beaks developing. Um, another example would be this island where a bunch of people had cats um, and because this population of cats on this island was isolated from new cats coming in, there was a lot of inbreeding with the cats and there's now a, an actual breed of cat that has no tail. They, they, they inbred so much that they started getting cats with no tails because of the massive inbreeding. That's what they're referring to here, and that there's this genetic bottleneck, and that, that the lizards that are in one place are different than the lizards in the other place, and that proves evolution. The problem is, again, going back to our happy little trend, the lizard is surprisingly still a lizard. It is not anything but a lizard. It did not grow feathers. It did not learn to fly. It's still a lizard. Okay. Number four, cane toads. Um, 
more invasive species. Point is, cane toad, at the end of the day, is still a cane toad. Darwin's finches, I just talked about them. Yes, they developed different beaks. And what did they turn into? The finch. And what were they before? A finch. That does not prove that over billions of years that a rock can turn into a, like, pine tree. If you would like to believe that, that's fine. But that's your belief. Because these birds develop different beaks, all it, per all it proves is that the birds develop different beaks. If you'd like to believe anything beyond, above and beyond that, it's a belief. It's not fact. Okay, number two. Butterflies. This is a very interesting one. Um, there was a virus that came in and attacked this population of butterflies. Again, you can read it yourself. I'll put the link in the description. The virus attacks this population and it mainly attacks the males in the population and it brings the males in the population down to a 1%. And then the male population jumps back up to 40%. And that 40% is immune to this virus. So they're saying, look, they've developed an immunity. The problem is the immunity to this virus was already in the genetic code. There are, there are many different variations in the genetic code and you'll have people, there were people that were immune to penicillin before penicillin was invented. These butterflies were immune to this virus, a very few of them. All that happened was that all the butterflies that weren't immune died. So therefore, the only ones that were left were the ones that were immune, and so that genetic trait was able to pass on. This does not mean that you can evolve to something other than what you started as, because the genetic information was already there. For this butterfly to evolve into anything but a butterfly, information would have to be added that was not already in the genetic code, and would have to turn the butterfly into something other than a butterfly. Why I emphasize that point is because of the next thing, we're talking about E. coli, right? And it's talking about how they mutated E. coli and whatever, and it turned into E. coli. This is a fa the, these type of experiments are, are some of the, f the favorites that evolutionists like to bring up. One is uh, this bacteria that the, like 2,000 bits of new information was added and was able to digest plastic and um, sorry about that um, and it's able to digest plastic. And so, yes, new information was added. Like I said, for evolution, you would need new information to be added. New information was added in this case. And what happened? The bacteria magically turned into a bacteria. So it doesn't prove that a bacteria can be anything but a bacteria. So if you'd like to believe that a bacteria can turn into anything but a bacteria, that's fine. But until you show me proof that it can, that's not science, that's your belief. Okay, so I've just shown that all of these things are not actual proof for Darwinian evolution in that a change of kinds, in that a rock can turn into a person or a banana or anything else given enough time. Because that's essentially what they're claiming at the end of the day is that non-life turns into life and then simple life can turn into complex life. This only shows that butterflies, will, moths will produce moths, skinks will produce skinks, crabs and mussels will produce crabs and mussels, cane toads will produce cane toads, finches will produce finches, butterflies will produce butterflies, and E. coli will be E. coli. That's all they proved. None of those things turned into anything other than what they started out being. So that does not prove that we came from anything but human. You can't prove that, therefore it's not science. Again, if you'd like to believe it, that's fine, but you can't prove it, therefore it's a belief. If you'd like to believe it, that's fine. So, I hope you found this informative and, in, and enjoyable. Please leave your comments and suggestions and whatnot in the comments below. Check out the links. I'll post a link to this video and this article in the description down below. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.